December 23rd, A Ginger Story Part 2. A few days later, I'm pulling up outside of my girlfriend's house, Dee Dee. Deirdre or Dee, I can't actually stand Dee Dee. Carling, I'm back in my once brand new Model T Ford, desperate to show it off to as many people as I can, but dismayed by just how popular and easier to get hold of this car it is becoming, and how old it is now. I'm picking her up to take her away with me on the holiday. Holiday. The word seems almost meaningless. I'm more inclined to think of it as leave. But leave from what? I certainly never had much during the war, and now that it's ended, this is not leave from that. It's more of a holiday, but that suggests freedom, not that I feel I have that, because I know I'm going to have to return. I honk on the hooter to tell her that I've arrived. Of course, I can just knock on the door and greet her properly. Of course I can do that. However, I feel a certain level of optimism creeping over me. I certainly know from the level of excitement that Dee's been generating over the last few days that I'm not going to have to wait long for her to come out of the house. I barely even need to honk the hooter, as I can detect a movement by the curtains. She must have been waiting for me, but I pretend not to notice. Very shortly, Dee comes out of the house carrying her suitcase with her. I get out of the car to meet her. We kiss, and I put her suitcase into the back of the car. But I notice just how deathly pale she is. Very pale. I wonder what excuse she's given people, how she managed to get away from a chaperone. I wonder even if she's just running away without telling anyone. What ho, Ginger? There's a certain way that the middle classes of England speak, and she's no different. What ho, Dee Dee? Off to West Wales we go. Absolutely spiffing. I think of tennis, cricket, and strawberries and cream. Right now she's bowling a cricket ball towards me, but it's shaped like a strawberry as it gets closer to me, and I'm able to pick out that detail. I raise my racket and go to hit the strawberry for six, but it reaches my racket and, as I hit it, the impact is too much. The strawberry, serrated by the racket, splits into a hundred pieces, leaving a trail of red glistening in the air for a momentary existence. I feel a sense of deja vu. I've seen that somewhere before. Where? I start the car and off we drive. We're going off to stay at a small cottage by the coast over the Christmas period. Something. A privilege that has been denied me for too long. Only, this year, it's going to be much more special. I have four years of catching up to do, and, as I recall, there's a pretty hot little mama that works in the bar nearby. Dee has lost her chaperone. Dee expects me to propose to her. But how can I commit? I've spent the last four years not getting to know anyone in the fear that they will go away. I can't get over that quickly, and it's not like I have a great track record when it comes to long-term relationships, despite how great a person Dee is. However, back in the car, Dee is beginning to get a bit restless. Now that I'm aware of this, I guess I'd better find something to occupy the time. My mind's tired, though. I can't be doing with getting into a discussion right now. Today is the first day I haven't had to get up before six in the last four years. That didn't happen, though. I got up at exactly the same time I get up normally. But the idea of not having to do anything is creeping up on me slowly, and I'm feeling sleepy. I just want to pick it up and throw it away. No good having a conversation. It's difficult enough trying to concentrate on the road without it turning into a tunnel of sleep. But for someone who looks like death, she has great amounts of energy. I need something mindless, but something to keep me awake. A game. Anything. Something children play. She'll enjoy that. I know. Let's have a sing-song. I say stupidly. Spirit-lifting mess habits die hard. What a dashing idea! What should we jolly well sing, hmm? Ooh, ooh, let's sing Ten Green Bottles. My mind's died. My brain is no longer connected to my mouth. This makes Dee Dee laugh. She hasn't sung this song since she was six. I will discover later. Well, there. Let's sing a verse each. You start. I start, 
But despite my amazing academic record and my excellent flying skills, my singing is not quite up to scratch, but it is made up for by effort. It's more to do with the fact that my mouth is having difficulty enough forming words without having to put a tune behind them. Dee, on the other hand, had always been a good singer and has had her moments in the music halls around the country. This strange mix of singing attracts much attention as we drive through what has now become Marlowe. What shall we sing now? said Dee when we finished. I'm feeling a bit upstaged by Dee Dee singing and decide to change track. I'm also too tired to put any effort into singing, as I've just found out. How about a game of something such as I Spy? My mind lacks inspiration, but it is well received. What a dashing idea! I'll start! I spy, with my jolly eye, something beginning with... She looks around, trying to decide what to spy. Finally, she settles on something. Ah! Oh. Without looking around, I just say the first thing that I can see that begins with that letter. Road? Dee's surprised. She obviously hadn't expected me to get it so soon. She looks hurt, putting it on, but can't keep up the pretense. Oh, Gingy, you're too good. You got it in one. Your go. I tell her I have to stop first. I am so hungry right now, and I need something to eat. Dee decides that she wouldn't mind a bite as well, so we stop off at a little cafe. We chat whilst we wait for our order, making the only noise in the place. Our sounds reflecting off the stone walls. It is an early hour of the afternoon, and we are the only ones here. The waiter, an elderly gentleman, brings us our orders. He puts the two dishes in front of me and tells me that I must be hungry. I say yes, first leave out of war and all that. And he looks at me. He mutters something about having to prepare something, and he leaves. I push Dee's plate over to her and tuck in eagerly. I pay attention to nothing else until I have finished. I sit back and relax before noticing that Dee has not touched a morsel on her plate. I ask her if she's going to eat it and she tells me she is not and she is not as hungry as she thought. We leave. We are just getting back into the car when a woman in her early thirties, I take a guess at, approaches us. It is only because of Dee Dee's interest that I don't just drive away. Excuse me, sir. You haven't got a spare penny or two, have you? Only my poor Bobby got killed in the war, and I haven't been able to pay my way since. Got chucked out of me own house. Please, sir, just a halfpenny would do me. I tell her to hang on a minute whilst patting my pockets, hoping I hadn't just spent the last of my cash. Dee leans over to hand the woman some money, telling me I can pay her back later. I smile at the woman. It's all the same to you lot, isn't it? She asks as a reply. I look at her, confusion forming on my face. You think, just because you've been in the war, that no one else matters, don't you? I'm sorry? Just because you've still got that uniform, don't mean you can't help out a war widow. You ain't the only ones who've suffered, you know. You said you'd give me some money. Where is it? Didn't we just give you some? We? Who's we? I just drive off, not wanting to talk to this insane lady anymore. We just drive in silence until we are getting out of Marlow, and beginning to get even more tired. I do not think that that meal helped in the slightest. Well, Dee asks me, it's your turn now. I don't want to play anymore. Let's just go. My foot puts more pressure on the accelerator. I'm forgetting why I wanted to play these games in the first place. All right then, my turn. I stare around, my eyes beginning to swim with a lack of focus. I don't know what I can or can't see anymore. It's beginning to get dangerous to drive, yet I've been in this situation many times before, albeit in a plane, not a car. I just need to go into automatic mode, but it's difficult when you've got someone nattering in your ear. I can't see anything. I look into the sky, hoping she won't think to look there, so I can drift off into neutral while she guesses away. I look into the sky which turns into space. I can see all the usual planets flying around. That's too obvious, as does the shooting star with its trail of debris, turning red, shimmering in the pure sunlight, reminding me of that strawberry and that sense of deja vu. Constellations of stars. If I pick one, she will never guess. But I see something else. It looks different, not out of place. 
designed for its purpose here, but still very foreign. Back down on Earth, in the glorious daylight sun, I speak. Ooh, I spy with my little eye, something beginning with T. T? Ooh, a hard one. She looks around. As she does, she must notice the trees flying past us. Ooh, I say, Gingy, slow down. I mean, you are travelling at a dashing speed. Slow down, old bean. Sorry, old beanette. Besides, that started with I, not T. Along with my singing, my jokes really aren't up to much either. But I laugh anyway, manically. I also neglect to slow, doing the opposite. Oh, don't be silly, Gingy. She playfully punches me, causing me to assume that my aircraft has just been hit. Me reaching out to battle with the joystick, readying myself for emergency procedures, as well as looking out for the nearest enemy aircraft, trying to work out who shot me and who is the most immediate threat as I swerve off the road into a ditch, which, fortunately, is not too difficult to get out of and back onto the road. D takes a guess. Oh, I know. It's a tree, isn't it? You'll have to try harder, I'm afraid. I jolly well give up then. As I'm falling through space, I'm getting closer to the object at quite a significant speed now. But soon it stops growing any bigger and just stays at the same size. Not growing, not shrinking. I realise that I've stopped falling through space. Yet, that still does not explain what it is. My mind is tired and I cannot describe what I see. I cannot explain it and I do not know what it is. But my mind still searches for an answer, a name, and in the depths of space, all that can be heard is my one and only answer. And I scream out its name. It's Thingy! Dee Dee laughs to herself. You're so silly. Yes, you keep saying, but if you bally well look up there, you'll see what I'm on about. Dee Dee looks up to the sky. I was right. There's certainly something up there, although she too cannot make out what. All we can really see is a small, round, black dot. It also appears not to be moving. Oh yes, what is it, Gingy? I don't know, old chap it. It's not moving, so it must be a, a hot air balloon. As we both continue to look at the object, there seem to be small lights flashing at different points. It is not entirely unfeasible that it's a hot air balloon in this post-war world we have suddenly been thrust into. There is still a large amount of paranoia that no one feels completely safe, and the Great War proved that. Everyone expected the war to be over in a couple of months. That was wrong. Everyone thought the greatest technological weapon we would need would be the horse and the cavalry. We were wrong. As sods in the aircraft thought that we would only be needed to spy and go on reconnaissance missions. We were wrong. We shook hands with the 20th century, well and truly. Maybe the lights are a new feature for relaying visual messages. What's it doing, Gingy? Well, just floating, I imagine. It does look awfully high, though, and it must be pretty darn big if we can see it at this height. I do say, I hope the people inside are all right. How exciting it must be, though. They must be able to see for miles around. I wonder if they can see us. That would be the point of having place a reconnaissance balloon. But why is it there? Do the government expect an attack? From whom? D starts to wave frantically and ends up by hitting me a few times by accident, distracting me. This causes me to stop. Just as well. I need to sleep. But not yet. Please be careful, Dee. You almost caused an accident. I'm sorry, Ginger. I was only trying to get their attention. You're not going to be able to. Not when they're at that height. I wonder what they are doing, though. It must be awfully darn cold. Dee looks at me, realises how tired I've become, now that I'm starting to unwind. She offers to drive. I protest, as I don't want her to destroy my car. But she insists, and I give in fairly easily. I give her a quick lesson and take my position in the passenger seat. It is my responsibility to be the navigator. As I sit there in the car, I watch other cars shape the strawberries fly by. 
I can't get strawberries out of my head. I can't even remember how they got in there, as I've eaten none today. But the cars aren't strawberries anymore. The driver's heads are strawberries instead. Heads. Strawberries. Streaks of red flying by. I think this, then look back to my controls as we fly over the Belgium line into the battlefields. Flying over the British trenches, believing I can see and hear the Brits beneath me cheering me on. This gives me a sense of glory and purpose as I fly into no man's land, the fear having suddenly left. The mission, as always, is to spy out the German lines. That's obvious. That's all we've done since the war began a few months ago. We're reaching the German lines now, and there is ground fire. But that's easy to avoid as the guns are slow and the rifles have no effect on us as we're too high up to get effective range. The mission is going successfully. We've completed our job and we're turning round to go back. But there's something new. The Germans have got their air force and they are coming to attack us. This has never happened before, but it's happening now. We've always been warned about the possibility of attack in the air, but never really got that far, and I have no idea what's going to go on. There's only one thing for it. To plough forward and pray for the best. I pick my target and start flying head on towards it. My guns are blazing, stalling, stuttering back to life, then failing again. Better to ease off. I'm getting closer now flying virtually head-on into the German, both of us firing away, not hitting, turning into a game of chicken. Who's going to fly away first? Or are we just going to smack into each other and score our kills that way? My confidence fails me and I swoop away, relieved to find out that he did at exactly the same time as me. I swivel round in my seat, trying to see where he's going, trying to get myself back into a position where... I can destroy him. Looking around, I can see that the whole air battle is a complete farce. No one scored a hit. All flying aimlessly around, narrowly missing flying into each other. I find my nemesis and get him in my sight. I'm pursuing him this time. But he's found another prey, and I can see the guns glaring, and I feel as if I'm that bullet, flying towards the target as I desperately try to work out who the target is. I can feel myself being ejected from the gun, flying through the air towards the British aircraft that has been chosen to be destroyed. The airplane is in my view as I drift towards it at speeds mankind will never know. Only, I'm not going towards the plane. I've missed. All that's in my path now is the head of Stephen, my commanding officer. And I slam into it. With all of my force. But I'm not the only one. There are many more bullets behind me all on the same course, though not all of us will hit this target, and some do tear holes in the plane. I see this, and I see the opening up of Stephen's head, the way his once freezing pink head just dramatically changes colour, leaving a trail of blood in the air, glistening in the sun as the cold freezes the drops slightly, and the momentum forcing them forward slows down converting itself into a downward movement as gravity takes hold, widening the band left in the air. The plane, itself relatively unharmed but now uncontrolled, goes into a graceful dive towards the earth, not stalling, not going into a spin, but just gracefully arcing itself so that it faces downward. As I watch, all I can sense is that this is the most beautiful sight that I've ever seen in my life before reality kicks in and I work out what's going on. Things are getting dangerous now. As wingman and next of command, now that Stephen's dead, I signal to my boys to get out of there, a retreat. We lost that round, but we were unprepared. The war has changed once again. We will be back though, and we will destroy. My debt to Stephen. D asks which way to turn. I consult the map, a left turn is needed.